I received from the Mountain Top Joiner Shop here. This is part two of my dovetailing a huge case by hand video. Uh, where I left off in the previous video, I had cut out the tail boards and I had paired the miters for the miter corner dovetails. And in this video, I'm going to be transferring the marks from those huge tail boards to the pin boards. I'll go ahead and cut out the pin boards. We'll knock the joint together. And then after glue up, we'll take a look at those dovetails and see how they turned out. And if there are any gaps, I'll show you how to fix those. So stick around. Here in this next panel, I notice I have a little bit of a problem. Because it's taken me so long to do these dovetail joints, this panel actually moved a little bit. So it's got a little bit of a cup to it. So the middle of the panel is further back than the edges are. And I tried to clamp that out with the clamps and that helped a little bit, but it's still such that there's daylight at the ends when I have uh, these parts of the baseline nice and covered. And of course, if I get rid of this daylight, then this part of the panel will be too far back. So the way I'm going to fix that is to take this off again, take off my clamps, move that out of the way, and I'm gonna put some sort of pad underneath there. So I'm gonna grab some tape, I think, I have random stuff all over the shop that I can use for this, but I think I'm just going to use some blue tape. So I'm going to put a bunch of blue tape right here in the middle of my saw bench side. A little bit sticking out the bottom so I can pull it off again later. And what I'm aiming for is about the thickness of what my gaps were at the outside edges there. And then I'll try lining it up again. And when I clamp the side panel, to the saw bench, that should push some of the cup out of it. Get that tightened down. Same over here, just like that. And then I'll put a straight edge on there and see how much cup I have left, if any. I got rid of it. In fact, it's almost pushing it the other way, so I can actually loosen these clamps a little bit to get that perfectly flat. Of course, once the dovetail joint is together, uh, if it's well fit, it will hold that panel flat. All right, so I'm gonna fiddle around again, get it all lined up. With that bow taken out of my side panel, it should be easier to do that. One more thing before I forget. If you don't mark which panel is the right panel, which panel is the bottom panel, which panel is the left panel, and which one's the top panel, and in what orientation is up and which orientation is down, you're gonna deeply regret that later because all of the tailboards you've cut by hand are unique and that there's uh, variances in the way you've hand saw it. So you need to transfer those variances to the mating joint. If I was to get all these panels mixed up and then cut these pin boards, chances are they're not gonna to go together very well. So very important to keep your panels uh, marked in a way that makes sense to you so they're oriented in the right direction when you put the joint together. So keep that in mind. Now we're getting into familiar territory for me at least. So this is the way I like to do my dovetailing on anything that's smaller than the case I'm doing in this video. And given that these case sides are short enough to fit in here, this is the way I'm going to be doing it. 
So this is my bench on bench. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I did a whole video about this thing. So I'm just gonna give a quick overview of how I'm gonna be set up for this operation. But if you wanna see more about the bench on bench, I'll go and watch that, that video. I'll put a link in the description. So I got my bench on bench here with a big Moxon vise in it. I purposely made it extra wide for situations like this where I'm dovetailing wide case sides. And just clamps to my workbench top. I got my sliding dead man underneath there, and underneath the uh, workpiece, I have an adjustable surface clamp. This is by Veritas. I think they call this the Wonder Pup. Looks like that. So I can adjust the height, the working height of my case side with that. Get in there clamped real good, and then I have a dog hole bushing because there's dog holes along the top of this bench on bench that I can put my desk clamp in, and that allows me to move the light wherever I need it to be to see what I'm doing here. And of course, the uh, joint that I'm cutting is right up in front of me. So it's easy to see. I'm not hunched over quite as much when I'm trying to, to cut this joint. And then I have my custom bond saw where it's dovetail saw I talked about earlier with the custom hang angle. Because when I get to the top of the uh, cut here where I level it out, I don't want to have to bend my wrist at a super awkward angle because of the aggressive hang angle that most dovetail saws have. So I got that going. And this TPI is really meant for thinner stock, uh, maybe half inch to uh, an inch or so, uh, or maybe three quarters of an inch. Uh, this is closer to an inch or like 24, 25 mil. Uh, so I'm gonna be doing a lot of sun here. I'm gonna be burning some calories, but it still gets the job done. And to that end, I'm hoping I can get away with removing the waste with my new Concepts coping saw. Uh, the a uh, wood cutting blade that I have for this coping saw is a little bit more aggressive than the one I would use for my fret saw, which is what I'd normally use in cases like this, because the fret saw blade is thinner and fits into the kerf left over by my dovetail saw a little bit better. If I can wedge this coping saw blade into that kerf, I think I'd prefer to use this to remove the waste here because there's quite a bit of it on these pin boards. That's my setup for cutting these dovetails. Uh, I got a lot of work to do here. so. I'm gonna go ahead and get that going and maybe show you a little bit of B-roll of that in action. Um, but when it's all said and done, I'm gonna have dovetail joints that are uh, about ready to go. I'm just gonna have to chisel away some waste here and do the miters on the ends because the pens on the corners of these, the way I did my dovetail layout, are going to have those 45 degree miters at the corners. So let's make it happen.
All right, so I've been chopping out the waste on my pin boards in much the same way I chopped out the waste in between my dovetails, and that's just with a chisel and a mallet. Uh, but it occurred to me while I was doing that that there's another way to remove the waste in between your pins that I'm not going to use on this project, but uh, might appeal to one of you, and uh, you can maybe make use of it. So uh, what I did here is set up one of my uh, pin boards in my bench on bench in much the same way I would if I was sawing the dovetails. And then I made it such that the ends of my pins are flush with a couple pieces of plywood stacked up on top of here. And then I gave it a little bit of breathing room and moved them back a little bit. And what that allows me to do is run a router, nice and stable on here, and route out the waste in between my pins. And the bit I would use to do that is this little guy. This is my white side router bits. And this is the 3000A. And I'll put a little picture on the screen here so you can see it in a little bit better detail, but it's a little bearing guided bit that you can run right against the sides of your pins without worrying about damaging them. There are, however, some limitations to using this bit. Uh, because it is a bearing guided bit, um, unless you like to live dangerously and freehand in between your pins to get started, you're gonna need to remove some of this waste just to get enough room to get deep enough to run your bearing against something. And in my case, that would be with a coping saw like I did here. And I'm perfectly comfortable running my coping saw quite close to my baselines and just chiseling out whatever that small remainder of material is. So I'm just going to go ahead and keep on hand cutting this. Now, there are people that will run this bit depth right to their knife lines. Uh, I don't feel comfortable uh, doing that. That seems like a risk that I just don't want to take. Um, I'm not comfortable enough with power tools to give that a try and risk messing up my project that I've already invested so much in. I'm much more comfortable doing this by hand. That said, I did want to show you that this was an option in case it appeals to you. Well, I finished getting rid of all of that uh, waste material. I was in between my pins and now I'm checking for a square with my little dovetail square just like I was with my dovetails, except there's a couple things that are different because it's a pin board. The thing that isn't different is just checking the uh, the bottoms of my sockets to make sure they don't have any humps in them. So I'm referencing the stock of the square off the inside face of the joint to make sure that the outside baseline isn't obstructed by any humps that are in the middle here. See there's one there that I have to, to clear away. So, so I'm going to do that and then I'm going to check to see that the sides of my pins are vertical. Then it's time to check my pins to make sure that they're square or perpendicular to the baselines. Uh, when I saw these, I tried to saw them as vertical as I can, but if I am going to err from vertical, uh, I would prefer to err, say we're talking about this pin here, this side of it, I prefer to err on the side of this rather than this. Because if it's this, I can pare away that extra material down there and still get a really good fitting joint all around. Uh, if it is the other way, sorry, this way, then I have problems because then I have material that I really would prefer to add, not take away, in order to get the joint to fit cleanly. So if I'm going to air in my sawing, it's going to be to air this way a little bit. And so a few of these might need a little bit of pairing at the bottom of the side of the pin. And the way I go about checking that for square uh, with this dovetail square is I don't reference off the end of each pin like this, especially with smaller pin boards, there's not enough surface area there to really reference off of. There's not enough stability. But I can take advantage of the fact that this stock has extra material sticking out beyond the blade on it. So because this is a little dovetail square blade, I can take advantage of that and reference off the end of two pins at once. And that gives me a nice stable position from which to reference off of. Even with this really wide pin socket, I can just barely span that and check at least most of it uh, doing that same technique. So uh, that's a little trick that I figured out for checking square a little bit more accurately on pin boards using this dovetail square from Sterling Toolworks. sawing off the bulk of the waste on the pin boards for the miters. 
And just like I did with the tailboards, I'm going to cut as close to the line as I can without actually touching it and then pare away the rest so I get a nice accurate miter. And just like in the tailboards, there's a chance that when the saw drops through here, it can tag the adjacent, well, pin in this case, instead of tail. Um, but I took advantage of the fact that there is a big wide gap there and put my, the uh, board on here such that the top of my bench top is in between there. So it's kind of protecting that adjacent pin. Of course, I don't want to tag my uh, workbench top either, so I'll just put a piece of scrap there. And that's just a you know, door shim. So when the saw drops through, if it tags that, it's no big deal. So I'll go ahead and cut that. I'm about a millimeter or so away from the line. Just barely tagged it there. I think my uh, teeth on my crosscut saw are getting a little bit dull. I might have to freshen those up eventually, but in the meantime, I got a bunch of work to do. Okay, the last thing I like to do right before assembling the dovetails, or this last step before assembling the dovetails, is to ease the inside corners of my tails. So this is the inside of the joint that's facing me. And in order to get things to line up more easily and of course go together more easily, I like to ease these inside edges. Now it's very important to note that you're avoiding these little corners on the corners of your dovetails. I'm just taking from just inside of that corner in to the baseline, just like that, easing those edges. That was a big one. No matter though. And I'll come back and right at the baseline at an angle, knock out the waist. And do the same on the other side, oops, just spit on it, on the other side of the tails, same way. It's a little weird where these miter corners are, but it's still pretty doable. All right, here we go. Do that one, oh, a little more. Of course, I'm blocking all the light, so try not to get in the way of the light and the camera. So it's a little, a little awkward, but it's pretty fun to do, actually. I find it rather enjoyable. One time I, uh, I did these dovetails and I was doing the, I think I was doing a drawer side or something like that. And I didn't do it from the inside face. So when I put the joint together, I could see all these little miters here that I had done with my chisel. And that was one of those face palm moments that I think every woodworker is familiar with. If they've been doing it long enough. Oh, one more. Can't get in here, so I'm gonna have to move this. This is actually clamped to my bench top, so that's just so it doesn't move while I'm doing this operation. I'm actually going to match the angle of the miter to take that out of there. All right, so that's it. So the dovetail joints for this case are ready to be knocked together. That said, the rest of the case needs all kinds of joinery before I can do that. I have a couple of interior dividers here that I need to deal with and I need to cut a rabbit on all the case sides to fit a case back into. I have to drill holes for hinge pins. So there's a lot I need to do yet before I can put this joint together, but at least the joint is ready. And I'm ready to move on to the next step in this furniture project, which I am very much glad for. I'm gonna put this video uh, footage aside for now, do those other things, and I might make videos about those. Now I'll come back for the actual assembly of the entire case with the dovetails and the dividers, so that ought to be exciting. 
boy, has a lot of water gone under the bridge since I filmed anything in here. So uh, before the holiday break, I came in here, I got these dividers ready with some dowel joinery, which I did a video about. So if you're at all curious about dowel joinery, you should check that out. And I also planed the rabbits in the back of these panels to accept the case back eventually. And then I started to do the glue up. So I put the end panels onto the base first, and then I just used clamps to kind of draw the joint together. And then I got these dividers in place. And then all that remained at that point was to put the top on, but then I had to align not only with the dovetails on the ends, but with the dividers in the middle of these dowel joints. So at that point I thought, you know, this is a lot to do by one's self. So I uh, called up an acquaintance of mine, Jeff Fletwich from Jeff Fletwich Furniture, and he was gracious enough to come over here with some of his clamps and help me out. So he lined up these dividers with the dowels, and then I got the dovetails lined up, and then I took my dead blow mallet and I beat the living piss out of these joints until they went together. And that was a little bit freaky. And I think I might've hurt Jeff's ears a little bit, but it went together nice and tight. Nothing exploded or cracked or failed or any of that. And now I have a glued up case, finally. So let's take a look at these joints and see how they turned out. All right, so let's take a closer look at these and see how we did. And I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. It's not too gappy, but uh, I think this is, while I'm doing this, it's a good opportune time to remind you that I did a video where I spoke at length about what I call the craft value paradox, which is kind of managing expectations for what a hand cut joint should look like in the end. And basically the gist of it is if you go through all this effort to hand cut joinery and it ends up turning out like it was machine made, it's, you know, it's that perfect. Well, at that point, you may as well have done it by machine and saved yourself all that effort. A little bit of invariance in a hand cut joint is kind of part of what gives it its craft value. And as such, you know, it shouldn't be, shouldn't be perfect. That said, there are spots like look right there. So you see that? Okay. There's some, there's some gappiness going on here. And that's a bit much. So there will come a point where your hand cut joinery is a little bit too hand cut, so to speak. And I think it requires some addressing. So I got a couple spots here that are pretty gappy and uh, not quite up to the more realistic standards of hand cut joinery, in my opinion. So why don't I show you how I go about straightening out this stuff? So it's moments like these that make you glad you kept all those scraps and little off cuts from your project. I never throw these out until I've actually finished the project because you never know when you're going to need another little piece of something rather. So I've got a bunch of walnut offcuts in here and these are what I'm going to use to fix those gappy dovetails. So fixing gappy dovetails, although it's a little bit time consuming, conceptually it's really simple. Basically all you need to do is to create some wedges that, you'll can, that you can drive into these gaps uh, with some glue and then just let it dry, cut it flush, sand it, and it'll all but make those gaps disappear. Now, there are a couple of things that will get you better results with a little bit less effort. Uh, one of those things is to try to choose scraps that match the color of the end grain where your gaps are. So you can see this is really light colored, almost like sapwood in this walnut here. Uh, that doesn't match at all. So you don't want to use that for your stock. Here's one that's a little bit darker. This is really dark actually. Although this is, some of this is actually burning from where I cut it with a track saw or something. But there I have a much better match in terms of the color and the darkness of the wood. That could potentially work. So that's one thing you wanna do. You wanna to try to kind of match the end grain of your uh, shims or your wedges to the end grain of whatever tail or pin is adjacent to your gap. And then another thing that you'll need to do is try to choose wood. Try to choose wood where you have straight grain on all sides. If it's all wavy gravy on one side, when you uh, go to make your wedges out of that stock, uh, it can actually be quite weak. So when you try to drive the wedges into those gaps, it'll just crumple like a corn chip or something. Uh, so we want to try to get straight grain material if we can. And the best way I think to do that is to actually split out the shims that you're going to make your wedges from uh, using a hatchet. All right, so now I'm down here on my floor here. I have a, an old chopping block that I've had around forever. It's just a chunk of maple that I've used for all kinds of random things. But uh, this is a good place to split some stock from these little pieces of scrap using my carpenter's hatchet. This is from Grants vs. Brooks. It's really nice. I used to use this a lot more than I do now. I used to actually even rough out 
inside curves, big ones, with this hatchet actually, uh, before I had a bandsaw. But now that I have a bandsaw, this reel only gets used for splitting material anymore. And so basically what I need to do is take my pieces of scrap that I think hopefully have some straight grain to them and just try to knock off a little chunk of it like that. So you can see this wedge is nice and thin and it cut pretty straight there. I mean, the, the, the top and bottom of this are almost parallel. So I think this is material that I should be able to use to make my little wedges from. And I'm going to split off a whole bunch of them because some of them might not turn out like this one's too thick. That'd be a too fat of a wedge. So I'm not quite the assassin with this <laughs> with this hatchet that I used to be. So I'll just keep knocking off a whole bunch of pieces. See, I got a couple thin ones here. I think I can work with this. This is good straight grain material. It's a good grain match. Uh, that one's too thick. But you kind of get the idea. It's good to split your material off so I know that my grain runs all the way through it like that. Okay, the next step here is to pair these little cards or shims or whatever you want to call them down into wedges. So I got an old bench hook here. I have a pairing chisel that I just touched up the blade on and I'm going to use a little backer here because this is a plywood fence back here and when I jam my pairing chisel into that it could end badly so I'm just going to do that. And So I'm just going to take my shim on whichever end is a little bit thinner. This one's pretty thin on this end. We'll see how that goes. You just pair it down like this. And I'll continue to do so until I have a wispy thin end on this. I think I'm going a little bit against grain there, so I'm going to flip it over. Getting thinner. I'm going to keep pairing that until I have next to nothing at the end. It's almost like sharpening it <laughs> in a way. It's going to be pretty pointy and pretty sharp on the end. They're starting to feather out this edge now. It's, it gets fat pretty fast though, and I'd like it to be thinner along the kind of the middle there. So I'm going to try to take some of that out. And this isn't working so great anymore because this is so thin now, it's sliding underneath <laughs> my uh, backer. So I'm just going to have to make this bench hook fence sacrificial. And that's, that's fine. It is what it is. Got to do what you got to do. Nice and knifey. Let's bring it over there. So I made a bunch of wedges and some of these look like they're going to fit in here pretty good. Like this one's a little bit tapered, it's a little fatter on this side than on this side. And you can see that this gap is kind of tapered as well. And it'll just fit into there just like that. And with a little bit of glue, and if I tap it home with like a little four ounce Warrington hammer, that'll fill that gap nicely. I have a similar thing going on here. This one here is a little bit fatter on this side than this side. You can see how it feathers out right there. And the same deal. That guy looks like it's going to fit there pretty well. And then I have this big gap on this end here. Now this one I might have to do in, in two installments, but this looks like it'll fit like that pretty well. And fill that end, and then I can come in here with a different shim and get this little tapered bit as well. And that's pretty much all there is to it. Now, when I was pairing these, I get these little slices of walnut off like this. You can see this is extra thin. And I can actually take some of these and go hunting for some of the other little gaps that might be here that initially I wasn't too concerned about, but since I have the material to, to fill them, I may as well go around and stick that into those and see if I can't shore those up a little bit as well. So you can even use uh, some of the pairing offcuts, basically, uh, in essence, a very thick shaving to put in some of these other gaps as well. So I'm going to warm up some high glue. I'm going to Stick these shims in, kind of tap them home and let it dry. Let's start gluing these in. So I'm going to do this one back here first. And you don't need to use a ton of glue on this. Just put that tiny little bit on there. And then I'm going to use a glue spreader. Kind of smear that around, just enough that the fibers are kind of saturated. 
Trying to get some on the other side as well. If you can see that very well or not. You just a smidgen more. If you overdo the glue, you're gonna be dealing with it later on when you're trying to cut these things flush. It's pretty good right there. And I'm just gonna very carefully insert this into the end. We'll, we'll tap that way. Doesn't take much. So I'm just using this little four ounce Warrington pattern hammer here to kind of tap those home. So like I said earlier, I'm gonna come back with another wedge and try to get this a little bit here. Now I'll go ahead and do this gap. This one doesn't require as wide of a uh, wedges I'm using here. Looks like I only need up to about here, so I'm gonna break that free. So, and you can see it's going in on an angle, that's totally cool. Whatever's gonna fill the gap that you can see visually is fine. I'm not trying to fill the gap inside the joint necessarily. This is all cosmetic stuff here. So I'll get a little bit of glue on there, support it with my fingers and tap it home. And this is one of those things where it's gonna look ugly before it looks good. It's gonna get worse before it gets better. I got another one to do here. This is another one where if, if I tap it in on an angle, I think it'll fill the gap fine. So I don't really necessarily need to reduce the width of this shim. And I'll just keep on doing that until I filled all the gaps I can find with whatever fits in those gaps. And uh, later on, after this glue is dried, I'm gonna come over here with the flush cut saw, start sanding it. And you'll see how those black gaps disappear when they're filled with brown wood. I've let that sit overnight, and now I'm in here with a flush cut, like a Japanese pull style flush cut saw to take these wedges off and cut it flush or close to flush. And then I'm gonna come through here after that with random orbit sander, but already, those gaps are disappearing. And as I move through this process, it's only gonna get better and better. As the sanding will help make this disappear a little bit more, and the finish will help things disappear a little more as well. I have a kind of a go-to finish I like to use for walnut that helps keep the wood nice and chocolatey brown, nice and dark, and a darker wood is going to show these little imperfections less than a lighter one would. Okay, so in the center of the frame here, you can see where I did my repair, and I'll go ahead and zoom in on it nice and slow so you can take a look, closer look. And the Autofocus kind of has to catch up with what I'm doing here, but. So that's zoomed in about as close as I can get without things disappearing out of the frame. And you can see all those repairs I did uh, worked out great. Uh, all those big gaps that were there, I uh, almost can't see them already. And I still have yet to do a whole bunch of finish prep, a bunch of sanding. And of course, once I get some uh, finish on this wood that helps darken it up, uh, even these smaller imperfections will start to disappear. And you pretty much have to take a magnifying glass to this to, to see any of them. So I think when it's all said and done and I have some uh, finish on this and I've eased the corners and everything's nice and sanded smooth, I think these dovetails are gonna look awesome. So pretty happy about that. So that concludes the second part of my two-part series on dovetailing a huge case by hand. And if you're thinking about doing this in your shop, I hope you picked up a lot of good tips that will make it easier for you and a little bit less labor intensive. Either way, it's gonna take a lot of effort. Sometimes your circumstances just dictate that that's the way you have to do it. In my case, this is the tooling that I have, so that's the way I did it. That said, if you have options, and the thing that you got from this video is that you definitely don't wanna do it by hand and you're out there shopping for dovetail jigs, it's fair enough, I totally understand that. So in either case, I hope you enjoyed watching this video and we'll see you in the next one. Now, if you like what you saw here, please hit like and subscribe, it helped me out a lot. Also hit the little bell icon if you want to be notified anytime I release a new video. And if you didn't like what you saw here, keep it to yourself, pal. Or watch one of my other videos. You might like one of those. Thank you for watching.